there are four um, main reasons why uh, you may encounter an abnormal opacity within the lung, and consolidation is one of them. The approach to interpreting consolidation is bucketized between acute versus chronic uh, presentations of consolidation and non-diffuse versus diffuse distributions of consolidation. Um, chronic diffuse um, patterns of consolidation would probably be incompatible with life, and so they're not one of the kind of the uh, patterns we're going to likely encounter. For this talk, we're going to be discussing the approach to acute diffuse consolidation. This is consolidation that is symmetric bilateral. Um, just as a kind of refresher, uh, we're using four to eight weeks in terms of our threshold to distinguish acute from chronic um, uh, consolidation. Um, sometimes you'll be able to t be fortunate to have prior imaging that informs your decision whether you're acute or chronic. Sometimes you won't. In those cases, uh, will there be some distortion of the architecture where the consolidation occurs to give a hint as to whether maybe it's chronic? Um, or will you have to potentially offer both acute and chronic consolidation differentials because you cannot necessarily exclude one versus the other. This uh, talk, as we said, um, focuses on diffuse consolidation um, in the lung. Uh, we've established that if we uh, refer to non-diffuse patterns, we're maybe talking about one focus or two or a few. And when we talk about diffuse, we're talking about symmetric diffuse events. Um, obviously, there's going to be a continuum of uh, involvement from non-diffuse to diffuse, and there's going to be a certain point in time where we're not quite sure if we're dealing with a diffuse or a extensive non-diffuse pattern of distribution. Um, not to worry, um, we'll show you at the end of this talk why. But for now, let's just uh, kind of focus on the discussion and the distribution of uh, a discussion of uh, how we approach um, the interpretation of diffuse consolidation. So basic principles uh, when it comes to interpreting diffuse consolidation on imaging. Number one, uh, chest x-rays just aren't that good. If you showed people um, diffuse consolidation um, blinded by, say, patient history and all the other things that we normally might have when we're interpreting, um, even the best radiologists are not going to be all that specific in uh, trying to figure out what's the cause. However, uh, we have to know what the horses and the zebras are here. And the two top uh, most likely explanations of diffuse consolidation by far um, are CHF, or cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and uh, ARDS, diffuse alveolar damage. Okay, What does that mean? That basically means that uh, normal day-to-day, -day, when we encounter diffuse um, consolidation on chest x-ray, because these two explanations are so, so common, uh, you really need to exclude them before you start entertaining other much less um, uh, likely or less frequently encountered uh, reasons. Um, so clinical history is uh, more important once you reach that point. We talk about clinical history. Um, so it turns out that if you um, try to diagnose the cause of acute diffuse consolidation, the best answer, regardless of history, is going to be usually cardiogenic um, edema or ARDS. All right. So you see diffuse consolidation in a patient with hemoptysis, cardiogenic edema, ARDS are going to be still way more likely than diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. You got a patient with an infection or an elevated white count with diffuse consolidation. Statistically, um, it's still more likely the answer for that diffuse consolidation is cardiogenic edema or ARDS than it is diffuse lung infection. So in terms of our interpretation or diagnosis pathway, Diffuse consolidation, always guess cardiogenic edema, ARDS, uh, diffuse, uh, diffuse alveolar damage, regardless of clinical history, unless uh, your provider has excluded those, um, and then you start thinking about what are the other uh, causes. And that's, at that point, you permit yourself to be biased by the clinical history of, say, uh, infection, uh, white count, uh, uh, fever, or uh, hemoptysis, what have you. Let's talk a little bit about cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Uh, left start heart failure, number one cause. Uh, common cause for symmetric diffuse consolidation. Here's an example, uh, kind of a nice fluffier one, and one that's a little bit more heterogeneous. 
ARDS, diffuse alveolar damage, our number two most common cause of diffuse consolidation statistically. Um, often hard to distinguish at first from cardiogenic edema. Um, some um, some features we've discussed here that you may encounter as you um, see the patient a little farther out. And here's an example. This is diffuse symmetric bilateral consolidation um, in the setting of ARDS. All right, we begin to entertain other differential diagnoses once the patient, um, once we know from our referring physician or from their notes that, hey, this probably isn't cardiogenic edema or ARDS, uh, diffuse, or diffuse, or diffuse alveolar damage. At that point, we'll permit history to bias us. Um, if the patient uh, has a history of fever or leukocytosis, and we know they probably don't have CHF or ARDS, then we start considering diffuse lung infections as the cause of the diffuse consolidation. If we're dealing with a picture of hemoptysis, um, once CHF and ARDS have been excluded, then we begin to consider, oh, could this be diffuse alveolar hemorrhage? And in cases where things aren't pointing to diffuse infection or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, and we've excluded CHF and ARDS, we begin to think about other causes of pulmonary edema, which we'll go into detail in a little bit later in this talk. But let's take the first presentation. If my patient has diffuse consolidation and it doesn't look like it's going to be um, CHF or ARDS, and things are pointing in the direction of, you know, uh, uh, lung infection, diffuse infection. Um, what are those diffuse infections? Well, um, it turns out that uh, most lung infections turn out to be non-diffuse. It's the list of uh, lung infections that present diffusely is actually uh, relatively short, um, and they're not all that common. Uh, Non-diffuse uh, is a much, much, much more common presentation for lung infection. Um, the differential diagnosis for uh, truly diffuse um, lung infections um, can be divided into what do immunosuppressed patients get and what do immunocompetent patients um, get. In immunosuppressed patients, um, two um, infections I'd think about that could cause a diffuse consolidative pattern are pneumocystis and HSV. Uh, Pneumocystis, as you're aware, um, can be seen in uh, HIV patients uh, with low CD4 counts, but they can be seen in other folks, uh, folks with organ transplants, for example. Um, usually the presentation, most of the time, is diffuse ground glass on CT scan. That's not really perceptible on a chest x-ray. Um, but in severe cases, that diffuse ground glass may present as, uh, may progress to diffuse consolidation visible on chest x-ray and the CT. Um, Typically, in these folks, no pleural effusion. And here's an example of one of these severe cases of uh, pneumocystis presenting as diffuse consolidation. HSV pneumonia, another um, potential cause of diffuse uh, consolidated lung infection um, in an in immunosuppressed patient. Um, generally, um, these can present uh, diffusely or uh, non-diffusely um, and may be associated with pleural effusions, at least more often than pneumocystis infections. Here's a case of a relatively um, symmetric, though albeit a little bit heterogeneous um, uh, consolidation due to HSV uh, pneumonia. In immunocompetent people, um, I'm going to be thinking of things like um, bad case of influenza, adenovirus, um, or some sort of, um, you know, um, kind of uh, epidemic or pandemic viral infection. Uh, on the subject of influenza, uh, we do know that there is a seasonal variation. Uh, most cases of influenza, fortunately, don't result in visible findings in the lung. When they do, um, a non-diffuse presentation tends to be much more common than a diffuse uh, presentation. Uh, when the diffuse uh, presentations um, um, occur, um, they can look a lot like, uh, in the more severe cases, um, something quite similar to really severe um, cardiogenic edema or ARDS. And, you know, if we really, really delve into the pathophysiology of these more advanced severe influenza um, infections, obviously there's going to be a little bit of blurry line between the difference between influenza infection and ARDS. Adenovirus, um, another cause of diffuse consolidation in um, immunocompetent individuals. Um, and here's an another, here's a nice example of one. Um, viral pandemics, epidemics, uh, unfortunately we are in one right now, um, can on occasion result in diffuse consolidation. 
But again, as like with uh, influenza, more likely to present, thankfully, as no finding in the lung, but, or if there is a finding, more often non-diffuse. But they can present diffusely. Uh, here's an example of SARS. So um, that's the differential diagnosis uh, list. Relatively short. Um, if you're entertaining the possibility that it's diffuse infection that's causing the diffuse consolidation and not just uh, CHF or ARDS. What are the causes uh, with uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, if that's what you're going to be considering based on the patient's history? Uh, we're going to be talking about um, systemic hemorrhagic disorders here that are playing out just system, diffusely in the lung. Uh, you may remember from the non-diffuse um, consolidation uh, discussion, we talked about uh, contusions and infarcts as uh, the causes of alveolar hemorrhage. Um, obviously, in those um, two um, processes, you're not going to have a diffuse process. Those are always going to be um, uh, non-diffuse. Um, as we said before, uh, hemoptysis is of limited use um, because we know plenty of people alveolar, with alveolar hemorrhage don't have hemoptysis, and plenty of people with hemoptysis don't have alveolar hemorrhage. Um, so, you know, take hemoptysis as a history with a grain of salt. Uh, understand that depending on how severe that um, hemorrhage is and the alveolar hemorrhage is in that lung, even if it's diffuse, uh, you may be ground glass at first and only diffuse consolidative when it becomes more severe. And this is the same slide we showed during the uh, non-diffuse um, um, acute uh, consolidative talk when we talk about alveolar hemorrhage, uh, systemic disorders, same chart as before. Um, if we're entertaining a systemic hemorrhagic disorder playing out as diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, um, break down the patient in terms of one of these four categories. Um, if previously healthy, think about pulmonary renal syndrome as a cause. If the patient has lymphoma or leukemia, think about platelet issues. If the patient has a bleeding disorder, is that the, is the cause? And if they are an, on a anticoagulation, could we be dealing with an over-therapeutic um, patient? Um, example of um, uh, diffuse hemorrhage, this is, um, uh, before it's truly gotten uh, consolidated, this is more ground glass to tell you the truth, um, but uh, kind of a more, slightly more severe case where um, the um, airspace passes are a little bit denser. Um, I'm still looking for a, a much more um, homogeneous uh, case, um, so we'll probably substitute that in when we uh, find one eventually for this talk. All right. Um, last group of people, um, if we've ruled out CHF and ARDS um, as the cause for diffuse consolidation clinically, and things aren't really pointing out, pointing towards uh, diffuse infection or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, we've got to wonder, maybe this is another form of pulmonary edema playing out. And when we think about these other forms of uh, pulmonary edema, I think in terms of uh, capillary leak edema versus hydrostatic edema causes, besides what we've just alluded to. When it comes to capillary leak edema, um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is effectively, in its uh, non-fibrotic presentation, especially what we used to call acute HP, um, that is effectively capillary leak pulmonary edema. Um, we've got to look like um, this. Uh, it may begin ground glassy or even would be central lobular interstitial pattern, but as it becomes more severe, um, become more diffusely consolidative. Um, going back to this chart, um, other things that can lead to capillary leak edema. Um, we're thinking acute lung injury again. Um, medications, um, illegal drugs, chemical fumes, transfusion reactions, and a few other strange rangers can result in um, diffuse pattern consolidation that is due to capillary leak edema. Here's a case of trolley, for example. Um, that strange ranger category, um, unusual diagnoses that uh, you may kind of hear about, but may not necessarily encounter um, all that frequently, other causes of capillary leak edema that are much lower on the list statistically. Um, near drowning is an example. Um, hydrostatic causes, um, you know, patients who have uh, end-stage renal disease who may be late for the dialysis or patients with uh, liver failure and low albumin levels, um, even patients who are excessively IV hydrated, um, potentially a um, explanation uh, that isn't just CHF or ARDS. Um, patients with pulmonary venous obstruction, um, some of this could be due to, say, fibrosing mediastinitis as an example. There are other causes uh, where we're impairing the return of blood uh, from the lungs. Um, and negative pressure edema, uh, final thing. Um, unfortunately, we may see this in the setting of uh, people who 
choking or other reasons uh, why you would be trying to breathe in against an occluded upper airway. But um, example, fibrosing mediastinitis resulting in uh, symmetric diffuse consolidation. Um, um, again, not ARDS, not CHF, um, but this is uh, due to um, basically um, the inability to uh, drain the lungs uh, through the pulmonary veins because they're been all kind of cinched off by the fibrosing mediastinitis in the mediastinum. So um, a list of things you might want to consider um, if you've excluded CHF and ARDS and signs are not pointing to um, diffuse infection or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage as your cause of the diffuse consolidation. So to fill in this chart with a little bit more detail, um, here you go. Um, uh, this is our differential diagnosis uh, we consider um, and uh, when we encounter acute diffuse consolidation on imaging. Now, um, we said earlier in the slide, um, okay, so it seems like there's one pathway for acute diffuse consolidation and there's another pathway for acute non-diffuse consolidation. What if the, uh, you know, the pattern of distributions, uh, extensive multifocal, which way do I go? Uh, do I use the diffuse or the non-diffuse pathway? Turns out it doesn't matter. And this is why. Um, on the left um, are the differential diagnoses that we consider in our pathway for um, diagnosing acute diffuse consolidation. On the right, this little kind of ring here, that's our differential diagnosis um, kind of um, little um, uh, picture for non-diffuse acute dif uh, consolidation. And you're going to realize there's a lot of overlap here. So you're going to get the same diagnoses in your list, regardless of which you choose, if you happen to be in a case where it's pretty extensive multifocal disease and you're not quite sure if it's diffuse or non-diffuse. For example, cardiogenic edema on both lists. Take that off. Um, another thing, um, let's see, um, viral lung infections on both lists. Okay, uh, next thing, systemic hemorrhage uh, um, issues on both lists. Okay. Um, acute lung injury, lung injury on both lists as well. And so the only things that are going to be only on one list or the other um, are left with, uh, let's see, we got ARDS, pneumocystis, HSV, hypersensitivity, um, some rare causes of hydrostatic edema uh, versus, uh, let's see, infarcts and contusions and aspiration pneumonitis, um, bacterial and fungal infections. Um, those two rarely present diffusely. Um, you're not going to be um, kind of at that much of a dilemma distinguishing what's left, um, you, know, um, it, you know, at this point, okay, uh, just because the distributions and usually some of the other ancillary findings are going to really, really help you. So don't sweat um, trying to decide if you're going to label the case as a diffuse versus a non-diffuse acute consolidation because um, these differential diagnoses are, they mutually cover each other, is what I'm trying to say.